Hello and welcome to this live and interactive web stream. I'm Kevin Harris. Now, keeping your family and children safe and healthy is the biggest priority for any parent. But how many of us would know what to do if our child was injured in the home? Being able to respond quickly when your child hurts himself or is ill with basic first aid is a key parenting skill, but it's not one that all of us are confident about. Well, with that in mind, and joining me here today with up-to-date advice for families is Joe Mulligan, Head of First Aid Education from the British Red Cross Society, and alongside him is Eliza Matthews, Children's Services Lead from Benedon Hospital Trust. And they're here to offer us their tips on what to do and where to go first if you suspect your child needs medical attention. So guys, thanks for coming and welcome to you both. Good afternoon. Thank you. Hello. Now, don't forget, we are live today, so if you have any questions for our panel, please use the box that's on your screen and we'll do our best to tackle them over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, so off you go, get your questions in. Now, recent research by the British Red Cross has discovered the most common incidents that parents of children have to deal with. And guys, we were just chatting about these earlier. These include things like children pushing something so far up the nose it's become stuck, uh, pushing things into their ears that it becomes stuck, and then the other one, which we've probably heard of as well, uh, heads and body parts getting stuck between railings and in the home banisters. Now, before we go any further, how common are these kind of like, you know, I problems. Think, I think they're relatively common, Kevin. I think the most important thing for all of us to acknowledge as parents or as carers, you mm -hmm. know, whether we are parents or grandparents, is that occasionally things will go wrong. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the evidence with regards to first aid, as he said in the introduction, is that the actions of the first person on the scene is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I suppose it's obvious to say that the first person on the scene in most emergency, however minor it may be, will be the parent, the, brand, the grandparent or the carer. However, you know, let's keep this in context. The vast majority of the scenarios that you deal with as a parent are pretty minor. But equally, occasionally, there may be the time when something pretty significant may happen. Mm. And therefore, you're going to have to rely on your first aid knowledge and skill. Yeah. And Eliza, you must have seen many different <coughs> sort of children involved in all sorts of different incidents over the years through your career. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we were talking earlier about the most important thing is usual instinct if you're the person looking mm. after that child. You know, things do go wrong, but it's about knowing when to leave it and everything's okay and doing the usual things that you do at home or to take it further, take them to A&E, take them to their GP if you think things aren't quite right. Mm. And, you know, we all worry as parents um, about what to do, grandparents, yeah. about being the care of the child. And you probably always feel more guilty if it's someone else's child that it's happening to. Mm. But it's just about getting the right help at the right time and doing something rather than not doing anything at all. It is. And I think it's also important, Kevin, is, is, is to try not to panic, as it yeah. were. Mm. You know, because inevitably, you know, even as healthcare professionals, you know, there's a tendency when it's your own little person, you will behave differently yes. than mm. when you're actually in a work operating in a professional capacity and of course again the research tells us that it, you know if you panic then that concern radiates onto the little person that you're looking after and if you're calm then they're for example going to be much more reassured that you do actually yeah. know what you're doing and that you are going to help them so I think you know trying to think you know calmly coolly and coherently is, is pretty important yeah I can imagine and also as well I mean, we've just mentioned there things getting stuck up noses and in ears and arms and legs getting stuck between banisters what are other common ones that parents are going to find themselves in? What do kids get up to around the home in terms um, of incidents? Burns as well, which we're going to talk about mm. later, I think. Um, I, I think it varies between patients often are pa parents, as it were, often think about the most dramatic stuff that may go wrong because that's the kind of thing they're most concerned about. Mm. You know, for example, a few years ago when the whole sudden infant death syndrome thing was of great concern to parents, and thankfully that has significantly reduced now. You know, we and the Red Cross, you know, had a lots of parents who were coming to us, you know, with great concern about what to do if they found their child collapse, for example, unconscious and not breathing. Let's be honest, Kevin, that is extremely mm. rare and it is a genuine concern, but let's not lose sight of the fact that it is very rare. Mm. So the kind of things that parents talk to us about now is most concerned is about things, the more routine emergencies, yeah. if that's not the, the wrong term to use here. You know, things like, for example, how to deal with fever, how to deal with seizure, how to deal with sprains and strains, as well as choking, as Eliza has mentioned. Yeah. So the much more, if I can say, routine emergencies yeah. that you may be called upon. Absolutely. Well, let's just, uh, we'll just stop there for a moment and move on because we've got, you mentioned choking there and we do have a short video now with some simple tips and help and we'll have a little chat about it afterwards. It's obviously quite a common one. So let's take a look at this. First aid for a child who's choking. Can you go and do your homework please, Nadia? But mum, I don't want... 
What's wrong? Are you choking? Cough it up! Give up to five back blows. <gasps> Come on! Hit them firmly between the shoulder blades. Give up to five abdominal thrusts. Pull inwards and upwards. Come on, Nadia! <gasps> Call 999 if the object has not dislodged after three cycles of five back blows and five abdominal thrusts. Remember, give back blows and abdominal thrusts. A frightening situation there for the little one involved, but that's probably quite a common one that we've just seen. I think a very common yeah. one, Kevin. And as you saw there again, children will try and do two or three things at once. Yeah. You know, eat and walk or whatever. And I suppose, again, inevitably it will happen at a time when they're, when they're eating and when they're mm. smaller, when they're feeding. And again, what you saw on screen there was, you know, a single intervention that we recommend, which is delivering back blows. Mm. But of course, delivering them in the right place with sufficient force to dislodge the object. And thankfully, you know, for the vast majority of choking scenarios, if you do that, then the outcome will be really good. Yeah, and I think we kind of like joked about the severity of the the actress in that little scene there really giving the child a bit of a wallop but yeah. you have to it's, yeah. not, you, you it's do. not a pat on the back no it? absolutely right I mean I think in first aid you have to understand the mechanical impact you're trying to have here and yes. what you're trying to do is create yeah. vibration and compression in the windpipe to dislodge the object so it moves as it were okay so yeah you have to again used in as we did in this case mm. you know almost controlled violence for the purposes of <laughs> yeah. of actually dislodging the object but of course if it is a baby or a child then the technique is very very different and we'll talk later about how you can access the information for those little people yeah even what smaller than yeah about zero to one yeah we, we tend to talk about a baby in for the first aid world of between zero and one and we talk okay. about a child then between one and puberty that's okay. a very very crude yeah. measure but that's yeah. roughly and therefore the interventions and the techniques yeah. as eliza was alluded to earlier will, will vary between the age groups so it's important yeah. to keep that in mind yeah uh well the next one that we can take a look at we've got another good vt now here and this Maybe something that you've experienced yourself, maybe over the summer. We did have one out in the garden on the barbecue. You might suffer a burn or two. Have a look at this. First aid for burns. Ow! Sarah, can you get some water, please? The hose. We're just going to put some cold water on it and soothe it. Cool the burn under cold running water for at least 10 minutes. Does that feel better? Get me a freezer bag and some tape as well, please. It's been 10 minutes. Cover the burn with a clean plastic bag or cling film. This will keep it clean and it won't hurt as much. Call 999 if necessary. That's it. I think we need to go to hospital. OK, I'll go and get the keys. OK. Remember, cool the burn. So another common one for you there, you may have had that happen out in the garden on the barbecue or in the case of my niece on Saturday afternoon, helping mum getting something out of the oven. But I mean, sound advice there, cold water and get it covered. Yeah, again, I think, you know, talking about a single intervention for any given scenario, cool the area as quickly as possible, cold running water. We've seen a barbecue scenario there. The reason we've actually shown that one is because the data again tells us that in a barbecue situation, there's often a significant delay yeah. between the burn happening, Kevin, and the actual treatment. Right. And, and almost that's inexcusable in a way because people believe they have to get them into the child, into the house, for example, yeah. put it under a, you know, a cold tap or whatever mm. and do a very very textbook approach to mm. it you know in the world of, of Red Cross first aid mm. you know use the hose use beer mm. use squash use whatever it is that's available it's to cold. you to cool it as quickly yeah. as possible and cover it using a piece of cling film or a bag as we've seen on there so again you know a very very organic approach to first aid yeah. using everyday household items and I just chatted to you earlier beforehand the the bag and the cellophane wasn't something that I was actually aware of but there's there's a good reason for that absolutely very good reason I mean first 
first of all, it's, it's available to you, which is really important yeah. in, in all of our kitchens. Secondly, it helps to keep it clean, but it also it helps to reduce the pain because one of the things that happens when you have a, a burn of this type is the nerve endings are damaged, they're exposed to the warm air, and that you know increases the pain for the child. So okay. again, you know, a plastic bag or a cling film is the kind of thing that would actually be used in the clinical area often as well for the treatment yeah. of this type That's of injury. keeping it airtight. Yes, absolutely, yeah. At what point with that one there that I was just thinking as you were chatting to me, at what point if, you know, that, that girl's burn there in the video was obviously quite severe, it's the whole of her hand, it looked quite nasty, you're going to take her to hospital. But if, would there be a burn that's less than that where you'd think, you know what, as a parent, we're going to monitor this for a while and if she's okay, well, perhaps we won't take her? Or would you always take her to... I, I think it's, you know, it's again about using your gut instinct right. as a parent. If they've mm. just burnt like your niece, the tip of their finger, mm. it's probably not worthy of a three hour wait in mm. the casualty department <laughs> to try and be seen for it. Mm. So I think as long as the child is well in themselves and there's no sign of infection yeah. and you've treated it with the cold water to try and relieve the pain and, yeah. um, and given them some cowpaw, because you can do that at home as a parent, you yeah. know, there's no need to wait until you get anywhere. Right. You can give the pain relief yourself at home that's perfectly acceptable for any health yes. person yeah. that you do that and then you know if you're worried about it then contact your GP right. and okay. just you know say to them I'm a bit worried and quite often they'll just say well I'll see you mm. and it's just about reassurance so yes, certainly yeah. don't have to take everybody to accident emergency no. okay. but, um, and manage it and if you're worried contact your GP. Yeah. I think Good. that's precisely right of course adv yeah. advice is available via a whole range of yeah. sources mm. at the moment mm. you know your GP your practice nurse a health visitor or whoever mm. Mm. so don't automatically default to A&E because no, as we know there's a crisis in A&E at the yeah. moment and the demands are high however you know, for a major illness, injury, or in this case, a burn, then absolutely, you know, Great seek stuff. medical advice as quickly as possible. And if need be, dial 999. Mm. Lovely. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, don't forget, of course, we are live here today. I can see on my screen here that some questions have come in already. So thank you for sending them. We are going to get to them just as fast as we can, but feel free to send a few more in. We're going to move on with our little video clips here now. And this next one, again, uh, common with little ones around the home, inside and out, head injuries. Take a look at this. First aid for a head injury. <coughs> Nadia! Yeah, Nadia! Are you okay? We're gonna put something cold on top of that to get the swelling down. Would you go to the freezer and get something for a head? Not okay. You've fallen off the trampoline and bumped your head. I think you got knocked mm. out for a bit. Get the child to rest and apply something cold to the injury. This will help get that bump down a bit. Mm. I think we're going to have to take her over to the doctors to get a check. If they become drowsy, vomit, or their condition deteriorates, call 999. Remember, apply something cold. Does that one look familiar? We were just chatting there as we were watching it that uh, there's probably many a garden in the UK that's got that exact model of trampoline. But injuries like that, head injuries, they don't just happen on trampolines. I remember when I was at school, I think a, a lad slipped off the back of his chair and banged his head on the table next to him and you know came up in a big sort of egg. So head injuries, kids taking knocks, that's got to be a really common one as well. Uh, very common and again, thankfully, the outcome usually is good. I think mm. the thing we must be really mindful of in terms of head injury Kevin, is that first of all, you know, treat what you see in terms of the, the egg or the bump mm. on the head. Mm. And as we saw there, something cold, you know, a bag of a frozen peas or whatever. The bruising's coming because blood vessels have been ruptured yeah, and so there's blood flush. Absolutely yeah. right. It's the, so way, it's, it's the way the body copes with the injury. You okay. know, for example, you get a swelling, you get a discoloration there. But also to be mindful though with head injuries that there may be some underlying damage as well in the form of concussion, for example. Okay. And the thing we're often mindful as far as that goes, hence we mentioned there if the child is drowsy, is that, for example, it may not present for some time right. after the original impact. Okay. So it's important just to keep an eye on them and as Eliza said earlier, you know, use your parental intuition mm. in terms of if they're presenting in a way which is out of kilter with how they would mm. normally present, then, you know, seek some mm. advice. Mm. We've got a question just come in there. Uh, Jane has sent one in. Thank you. She says, when my child has had an operation through the NHS, who's responsible for which parts of the aftercare? Now, the hospital team or the GP surgery? 
Um, I think, um, generally speaking, if it's an NHS hospital, they'll have people on the ward for 24 hours of the day, seven days a week. Mm. If it's immediately post-operatively, so your mm. child's just gone home that day or the following day, um, quite often the um, the ward will say, if you have any problems, please contact us. Yeah. If you've gone home and it's a couple of days later and you've running into problems, then maybe that's the time to go to your, your GP. Right. Okay. So I think it just depends on kind of what length of stay and what instructions you've been given yeah. from the hospital when you've been sent and, home. And pay attention to those instructions as well. Yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. quite often they'll be written down for you and given to you to, mm. in a leaflet. Um, mm. So, um, it, yeah, it's just about knowing who to contact. But the nurse looking after you would normally tell you right. what okay. to do. Good stuff there. I hope that answers your question, Jane. Uh, moving on a little bit then to this time of year, uh, I was with my nieces and nephews at the weekend. They were all coughing and spluttering. They're starting to get a few winter bugs and viruses. But as a parent or a grandparent looking after kids, how do you know when it's just a winter flu bug and then actually when it might be something a little bit more serious? What um, should you look out for? I think it's about if it's a normal cough and cold, they're going to be hot, they're going to be a bit floppy, mm. they're going to be out of sorts. If you're keeping them off of school, um, make sure they have lots of fluids, um, give them their regular cowpol and ibuprofen or paracetamol and ibuprofen. Yeah. Um, if you're doing those things and um, they're not getting any better. I think the important thing is if you're giving them something to reduce their temperature mm -hmm. and it's not being reduced with those things, then that's the time to get help. Right, okay. um, there's obviously rashes as well. There's a lot of innocent viral rashes yes. um, that yeah. are just part of the cough and cold, and that's fine. Um, but I think if, it, if the rash is irritating the child or making them even sicker, mm. obviously the one we think of is meningococcal septicemia, which is the really nasty rash which mm. if you put a glass on it most rashes um, will uh, disappear so if the rash doesn't do that then you maybe might think this is a bit more serious mm. um, I mean, the first aid role, just betting what Eliza is saying there, Kevin, is, you know, people will often say, what's a normal temperature, for example, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. roughly around 37 degrees, how do I re rehydrate my child? Again, you know, boil up the kettle, let the water go cold and add some kind of rehydration salts that are available in your chemist to that. Yeah. So, you know, there are things you can do to help counteract those kind of conditions, but, you know, having a little knowledge as far as that treatment goes is, yeah, people often talk about a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah. I think in the world of emergency medicine or first aid, a little knowledge is a, is a very good thing to have. Yeah, and I would imagine as a parent, arm yourself with knowledge for all the other parents at the school because everyone's yeah. in the same boat with their own kids. Yeah, yeah. So and, and trust your intuition yeah. as a parent. Yeah. Again, it? it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Both of us as parents know yeah. that at the end of the day, you know, you almost take your professional hat off and you yeah. make a judgment based on the fact that you know your child and how mm. they normally behave. And if something is out of kilter with how they would normally behave, or, you know, you become alerted, then act on your intuition really. Mm. I think the other thing with um, as with head injuries, if a child's got a cough and a cold in a high temperature mm. um, and we talked about earlier and they're fitting or they're drowsy then that's also a sign to be worried because okay. obviously the body's not coping yeah. in the way that you would normally expect it to if it was a normal routine thing so just there may be a couple of things to look out for. Okay, good stuff. Uh, thank you all to everyone who's sending the questions in, by the way. We've still got time for a few more, so if you do want to send them, uh, that's good to do so, just to use the box on your screen. Um, let's move on now. Non-emergency situations aside, and we were chatting about this earlier, uh, if a family has an, you know, an NHS consultation or a procedure or something like that, what sort of questions should the, the families ask beforehand, before they go in? I think most places, if it's a routine admission for, yeah. say, a tonsillectomy or a hernia repair or something like that, then the hospital will be in contact with the parents because as children's nurses, we're very aware that the more you know about the child before they come in, yeah. the better it is because you can actually use those things to then mm. help the child make that journey yeah. more comfortable for them. Um, so normally someone will go through and do a pre-admission with you right. and go through the sort of things. but. I I think the important things are, you know, let the child know where they're going to. Let them yeah. know that they're going into hospital. If they're having an operation, then they need to know they're going to have a sleep to have their operation done. Right, okay. um, tell them the truth. 
and be honest with them. And the other thing, important thing, is generally because of children's ability to um, mentally accept things, the younger their child, then you leave it for the day before they're going into hospital to tell them. Right, okay. Um, and if they're older, then leave, you need to tell them more days before so that they've got time to ask questions. But I think be honest and the nurse will normally go through things mm. with you. Are there any other sort of, you know, kind of planning implications that you can think of, you know, as a family that you've got to do? Is it like an, almost like a checklist before my child goes in, this is what I must do? Um, I think if you've got other children that need to be looked after, yeah. then most wards will say, please just bring the child that's going to have the operation. Right, OK. And there's a couple of reasons why. is because you don't want another person to look after because if you've already got mm. ten children on the ward and their parents, then another body is very busy. Also, then as a parent or carer, maybe you aren't able to give the, your child the attention they need. So it's really nice for them just to have you for themselves for that day. So if you've got other children, um, obviously get them cared for by someone else. Mm -hmm. um, the only real reason we say no to that is if you're breastfeeding a baby, then obviously they have to come with yeah, you to course. hospital. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is there's lots of books and D, um, you know DVDs and things out there to help yeah. your child. If you know they're coming in, then there's lots of information out there on the Benenden website. There's um, a little story about Sam who goes into hospital. You know, so getting your child to look at things like that and yeah. and that will help. To prepare them as well. Good stuff. Um, thank you to everyone who sent the questions in by the way. Tessa we've got one from you here uh, moving off from what we were just chatting about but important all the same. It says uh, where can I go for information about childhood vaccinations? Yeah, um, I think your GP is a very good start or your health visitor. Um, there's um, a set um, guidance on what the child should have and when and your GP or health visitor is the one that would normally help you with that. Mm -hmm. In also the child's red book that they take home with them when they're a baby, right. it's got the schedule for their um, immunisations <laughs> in there. So um, it's the GP surgery that normally, there are well baby clinics and things, but yeah. that's probably the best place to go. Good stuff, I hope that helps you there Tessa. Thanks also to Thomas who has sent a question. Thomas was interested about flu jabs. He says, I'm concerned about the flu jab being rolled out to younger children. Is it safe for them? And what are the circumstances where my child should have it? Flu jabs obviously something we usually associate with yeah. older members of the file. Um, I think it is more common that it's available. My understanding, because I haven't actually been involved in giving any, is that it's a nasal um, spray at the moment. It's mm. the common one that they're using. It's perfectly safe. I think um, the guidance is that the, you can have a reaction, but it's one in every million people that mm. have a reaction to it. Mm. I think, um, generally speaking, your GP will offer it if that's what they want to offer, because obviously right. different surgeries um, do different things in terms of funding and what they fund. And it would often, like the elder, be offered to people that maybe have diseases and things where they're not able to cope with infection quite right. so well. So they might be offered the flu jab um, because of that to help protect them, yeah. um, as opposed to every child. Yeah. But it's perfectly safe. The research is that it's, it's you know, like every vaccine, mm. it's very safe. Good stuff. I hope that helps you there, Thomas. Um, on a slightly different tack from Kelly here, but thank you for your question. She says, uh, and feel free to jump in either of you, says, do, any, uh, do you have any tips about diet for children, particularly the issues about vitamin supplements that are currently in the news? What about diet tips that will help children recover from operations? Um, I mean, if we go first, just talking about sort of vitamin supplements yeah, and I children. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the dietitians and paediatricians will say that if your child is having a normal, healthy diet, yeah. then that should have enough vitamins in it yeah. to to be sufficient for yeah. your child's needs. If you're worried about vitamin deficiency in your child, that they might actually have a problem about breaking down the vitamins, mm. then you should consult your GP about anything that you want to give them. Right, okay. I think that's pretty obvious there. Mum knows best, I think, with that one, isn't it? Mm. Um, and then also, uh, Kelly was asking about um, diet tips that will uh, help children recover from operations. 
I would imagine, again, similar advice, surely. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think that although we want our children to have their fibre day and their healthy fruit and vegetables, and that's going to give them all the vitamins that they need if they mm. have a balanced diet, yeah. when they've just had an operation, sometimes their tummies aren't feeling quite right, they might be in pain. Yeah. So I think for you know a few days after surgery, if they just want little bits and often, and they're not having exactly a balanced diet in that time, mm. it's not going to do them any harm. It, it's just going to get them through the fact that they might feeling not quite mm. right because obviously they've just had something done which is yeah. you know going to make them feel out of sorts yeah so absolutely. I think with those situations don't force them to have big meals no. you know just go for little snacks often make sure they're having the fluids yeah. because that's the most important thing if their appetites is diminished which it probably will be then getting the fluids into them and little yeah. bits and often is what I'd say Good stuff, lovely. Thanks ever so much. Uh, if you've just joined us, we've been live for about the last 20 or 25 minutes talking about looking after your kids and first aid in the home. I mean, we, we're sort of planning to talk for half an hour, so we have a sort of recap of people who've just joined us. But what are the kind of first aid issues, really, then, if we could almost put it in a top three that parents should sort of arm themselves with, Joe? I mean, what a well, first of all, I think, as we said in the introduction, Kevin, is, is to acknowledge that occasionally something will go wrong. Yes. To be yeah. forewarned and forearmed is really mm. important. The other, I suppose, misconception we have is that first aid is complicated. Right. It's not, actually. No. From, based on what we've discussed already and what we've seen on the film clips, you know, most first aid is common sense. Mm. You know, mm. the, the aim of what we're talking about today is to make that more common, as it mm. were, and that's why we're having it here. The third thing I would talk about is make a reference to people feel they have to have a first aid kit. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, we in the Red Cross are almost concerned about the fact that People's lack of knowledge in first aid appears to be, you know, the security blanket they get is go out and buy a first aid kit, yeah. but they don't know how to use the content of it. Two things about first aid kits, for the vast majority of us, even if we have one, would we, would we have it with us when we needed an emergency? Would we know how to access the stuff? Okay. So, again, on our website, redcross.org.uk forward slash first aid, we have a lot of advice on household items that you can use mm. for the purposes of, of, you know, first aid treatment, for mm. example you know a clean tea towel or a pillow cover for treating major blood loss we've already spoken about things like cling film for the purposes of treating burns and skulls mm. so in our homes already most of us have equipment that we need to use mm. now, you know there are first aid kits out there if you have some security from from buying one then please do but for the vast majority of us, other than plasters, you know, mm. the more routine things yeah. and the simple things, you know, we have equipment in our home that we could actually yeah. use. And it's interesting, you made a point earlier when we were chatting about from a Red Cross point of view, you know, it's, it is about first aid in all kinds of environments. So you've just got to use whatever's to hand. Absolutely right. And of course, the difficulty with educating people in first aid is you, you never know when it's going to happen. But yeah, I think of one of the things that really engages it, when we talk about it in, in the first aid community, is the beneficiary, as it were, of the first aid skill and knowledge that you or I or Eliza have, mm. will often be known to us. Mm. There's almost that misconception often that it's a stranger. Could I do first aid onto a stranger? Yeah. It, the reality is very different. Yeah. More than 70% of the beneficiaries of first aid will be somebody you know, or as we've just been discussing right. this afternoon, potentially love. Yeah. And that really is important. The other thing that really troubles us are people who are very well intentioned in learning some first aid, right. whether it's doing it online with the Red Cross or downloading our first aid apps or whatever, mm -hmm. but don't get round to it until it's too late right. or until they have a near miss. Yeah. You know, the plea this afternoon to the viewers is please don't leave it that long. All of our information that's online and our apps are free, so in a way there is no excuse for not having some basic learning. Yeah, well, I'll come back to that in just a second, but I just want to ask you, Eliza, you know, as a mum, what sort of you know, maybe drawing your own experience as a mum or as a healthcare professional, what would your final thoughts on dealing with first aid incidents with kids be? I think again, and we've said it like. before as a mum, because I, you know, I've got, I'm a nurse with lots and lots of years of mm. paediatric experience. When it comes to my own children, I go to pieces like any other mum. Mm. But I think it's about using your instinct. My son had a head injury. Mm. I dealt with loads of head injuries mm. in my time. He vomited once, which as we know, head injuries and vomits are very common. Yeah. Then he kept vomiting. So at that point I thought, this isn't right now. I right. need to take him to hospital. So it's about, trusting yourself you yeah. know that person better than anybody else mm. you know your child more than anybody else so use your your gutting if your gut saying i don't feel right even with all my experience i thought i i'm not sure i don't like what he's doing mm. so i i went to hospital yeah. with him yeah good stuff and joe you just mentioned the british cross website and you know 
apps and downloading information. You know, what sort of courses are available for parents and grandparents as well who'll Absolutely, be watching? Yeah. Uh, you know, are there any courses they could do or any information that they should arm themselves with now? Absolutely. I mean, our aim as an organisation, as you know, since we're having this conversation here, Kevin, mm. is to make first aid as accessible to many as many people as possible. Yeah. And yes, many people will be comfortable going along to a Red Cross venue or the Red Cross coming to your venue to, to train you formally in first aid, and we can do that in as little as two hours. Great. But also, as I've already mentioned, all the content on our website is free. Free. Okay. Please go on there. You can even get your own first aid certificate free on the website. Right. You know, for both adults and for babies and children. We have two apps that are now available free of charge. One dealing with adult scenarios and the other one dealing with babies Brilliant. and children scenarios. They're accessible via the website, as it were. You know, we're delighted that as far as the apps goes, almost a million people in the UK have That's downloaded fantastic. our apps. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And by the end of next year, almost 50 countries worldwide will have actually engaged in learning via our first aid app, which is a terrific thing. So, you know, it's out there, it's available, mm -hmm. it needn't cost you money, but if you do want to go onto a course to do some formal learning, then log on to redcross.org.uk forward slash first aid. Great stuff. And at Benenden Hospital, we run yeah, a course. free friends and family first aid, oh, which is for adults and yeah. children. Um, we found in the past that the uptake wasn't brilliant, but we're quite happy <coughs> for people to come along. So that is something we do do, and we do it for children as well. Because quite often it could be a child that's actually with an adult that's yeah. collapsed, and it's teaching them how to get help and what to do. Great stuff. And don't be afraid of it. Just arm yourself with the knowledge and yeah. just get on and do it. Use Absolutely. common sense. Guys, thanks ever so much. We're out of time, but it's been great talking to you. Uh, and thanks to you for watching along at home, wherever you are. Now, if you'd like to continue with your questions and thoughts related to your family's health, then why not join your Benenden Health online community by logging onto the web address that you can see below, secure.benenden.co.uk forward slash suite forward slash apps. Just click on that community tab to share and discuss with other Benenden Health members and to find out more information about caring after the show. So thanks for watching and goodbye.